All right, my name is Smith. I'm from the University of Edinburgh. Thanks for coming to this talk. When I was back in school, my maths teacher used to always say, mathematicians are lazy. And I thought, that's kind of weird. Like, why? <laughs> like, he's saying it as if it's a good thing? <laughs> I've realized over time that doing things the lazy way is often a wise approach. We just don't have that much time. So save time where you can, right? Now we're at the OER 23 conference, so I don't really need to be convincing anybody why, like we might want to open up stuff. Once you're at that stage though, and this is particularly relevant perhaps for learning technologists, for educators, uh, or for anyone supporting education, like what do you do now? Um, how do you actually open up materials? At the University of Edinburgh, we use Blackboard Learn really. And this year, or over the last year and this year, we're transitioning between versions of this really. We have been working with Blackboard Learn Original since 2010, perhaps earlier, um, and it is now deprecated. Blackboard have released a new version of Learn called Ultra, and while this might seem like a technical detail, it has an impact on openness as well. The new version has a better user interface, it has better mobile support, better accessibility features, lots of good reasons to move. However, one thing that's changed is they've removed the guest access feature. In Blackboard Learn, Learn Original, you could tick a box in course settings that anybody could access it without logging in. That is no longer possible in Blackboard Learn Ultra. And at least the School of Informatics is quite concerned about this, since we've had a culture of making our courses available openly before. And there's many, many reasons why you might want to do so. Not just for the public, but also for our own students. Think about prospective students who might want to decide whether they want to take a course or not. They need to see the course materials. Think about students uh, on different courses that have to, like they might not have time to be enrolled yet, even though they know what they want to do. Again, they would need access to a course. And also course organizers between different courses might find it easier to share materials uh, without having to go emailing back and forth if they can see what we have online. So this is a concerning thing. Um, we wanted to see with this team that I had shared up front, um, how do other institutions share materials with the public so that I can be the lazy person? What is the least effort approach that we can take our existing materials from Blackboard Learn and make them available for the public? So let's take a look. How do we go about this? Um, I hired a team of free research assistants, and we basically built a massive spreadsheet like this, right? Give a project to informaticians, they'll build you a big spreadsheet, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, don't worry. Um, if you're interested, I can share the spreadsheet. If you're not, I'm going to just summarize the details. Basically, we put together links um, to as many different um, sites that we're sharing materials publicly. And that includes open sharing and not open sharing. And taking a look at what kind of site is it? Whose materials are they? Who are they for? And also, how difficult might it be to recreate something like this? So this was a very quick judgment, uh, just seeing what is their site made with? For example, edX was top of the list created with their open edX framework. Um, so that was one option. And lots of others that come up, Drupal, Hugo, you see, Next.js. So lots of this comes down to like the actual web frameworks that they use to make their site. How do we make a decision of what would be the easiest way to go uh, to use for our own courses? Well, we put together uh, everything grouping by the frameworks and the tools that websites use. We got over 40 uh, tools from looking at like over 100 examples within our university and also outside of it. Um, what now? Like, how do we decide? I have 40 options. That is a lot to try. I can't give them all a go. I can't even analyze them properly. Um, so, you know what's happening? We built another spreadsheet. Um, <laughs> this time we're looking at some surface level criteria. Um, so here I've got the top of this spreadsheet where I have some frameworks like Hugo building a website just without any framework with HTML, the language of the web, having a GitHub repository using Jekyll, 
um, and examples of links that use these frameworks, some notes about what it means. But most importantly, we had some columns where we considered very surface level criteria. At a glance, how does it do for some automated benchmarks which consider accessibility, performance, search engine optimization? So how easy is it to find using a search engine? Accessibility, is there tracking and user management? It was really important for our university to be able to see, is this website being used? There should be some kind of tracking, say of views or downloads of materials. And it should be possible for users to log in because we want it to, be, to allow users to contribute content, yet moderate this. Um, some other criteria that we looked at, do they have an API and what kind of content do they support? We have a variety of things like in our existing materials, we want to have embedded PDFs, we want to embed videos, images, audio, we want to have code highlighting. So how difficult would it be to support all of these? Flexibility, like how varied can this be? How much can people tailor something to their own preferences? And then finally, we had four people evaluating the learning curve. How much effort would it be, in our opinions, to create a site using this? And we had four people do this independently because I think it is highly subjective. So hopefully, averaging out over multiple opinions, we get something closer to objectivity. But that's a bit hand-wavy there. So putting everything together into one graph, we map basically on two axes all of the options that we found. One is flexibility, which we really rated just red, yellow, or green. Here is indicated as three rows. So these are basically not much flexibility. Things are rigid in the way that they are set. Here you have some, and here you have quite a lot. And learning curve score, that is an average of how much did we think that it would be difficult or easy to use this. The higher we are, the more to the right, the easier it would be to learn to use this tool. And I'm thinking from the perspective of users who are using the site, not necessarily from the perspective of the people setting it up. So what I expected to see was kind of something like a straight line, that the more flexibility you have, the harder it is to use, the less flexibility, the easier to use, right? There's fewer buttons. Um, that's not what we ended up with, and I was quite surprised. We had a wide range of the kind of things that were all over the place. The only things that didn't really exist were things that are really easy to use and really flexible. Bad, that's what we were looking for. Um, but hey, we're still looking for things kind of in the top right quadrant. And among these options, we have a few that you'll probably recognize, like WordPress and Moodle show up as high flexibility and kind of easy-ish to learn. Um, then there's Silverstripe, there's using a GitHub repository, there's Jack Hill and Joomla, and a few other options. Now, we're evaluating from the perspective of how well or how flexible would this be for our School of Informatics. I wouldn't expect that if you applied this to your organization or institution, that you would evaluate it the same way. But hopefully, just knowing what options are out there and the links is a helpful starting point for evaluating them on your own criteria. So this helped us to narrow down to less than 10 candidates from like the over 40 that we had. But now what? Like, that's still quite a lot, and we still have to choose just one or two that we can try. So what do we do? Well, now we did detailed evaluation of the top few candidates, um, and this is just a screenshot from a Word document that we put together. It shows an evaluation of Canvas. Um, we put together links to all the example sites we found using Canvas, some screenshots of what it looks like, and then different criteria. How is content formatted? What skills would users require to use it? Um, I'm not going to go through all of them. But for all of the criteria, we basically also used the same color coding. Green is good. Yellow is eh and red is watch out for this. Um, I see some red flags, so I have to be careful. Um, so we did this for seven different frameworks. And then each of the four people working on this had their own ranking, which again is kind of subjective of what should we try and in what order. 
So we had the variety and I just summed them together to cancel out the differences in opinions. Um, so we ended up with our final recommendation report, which says, let's try Moodle, OpenEdX, Canvas, and MediaWiki first. What happens next <laughs> after this? Well, we're going to be trying a prototype for a single informatics course this year and evaluating it with focus groups of students to see what do they think. Okay. All this time we've been considering the lazy approaches from how difficult would this be to set up and how difficult is it for lecturers to put on content, but now how usable is the end result for students as our target audience and also a survey with informatics staff about how they find the uh, current prototypes. So we'll be doing this with at least one framework, hopefully two, three, maybe four, first time. We'll see. Mm -hmm. um, uh, always aim for the best and uh, let's see what happens. Um, this is still research in progress. So you can expect to see results from the prototype uh, implementation and student feedback at the Edinburgh Learning and Teaching Conference. Mm -hmm. I hope to see at least some of you there. It will be taking place at the end of June. But yeah, um, whatever happens, that's going to be going into school-wide deployment by September when our deadline is due to an ultra. That's all I had to show for today. Any okay. questions? Thank you so much. And I've now seen that 39 has been removed from the culture session. So you can remove yourself. Yeah, uh, um, anyone have to do it? No, I'm not I mean, it's, it's okay. I'm happy to control um, the, the two slides. Yeah, we can do it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And what else do you do? I don't know if we can get it back here again. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yeah, just on the Okay, it's going to be short. Um, is it on the main screen? And all for us. Yeah, yeah. Hi. Um, Welcome from me. My name is Lucy Beatty, and I don't come from very far away, just 60 miles northwest up the road um, at a place called Locker Room near Ellipool. And before I start today's poster presentation, I just wanted you guys to think about two questions, and I'm looking for some help. So hopefully, you might be able to help me. But I wanted to ask how do we define open educational practices within the definitions of public impact? And the second question, does that actually matter? So um, you can either speak to me here now or afterwards, but if you're interested in connecting with me at any stage, I do tweet. I've got a Gallic spelling with my first name, Lucy BT. That's only because I had an error with my previous user title, so I had to change it. And um, I also have um, a website, a blog called researchblog.scot. So you can have a look at some of the things I put there. And my email address is obscured, but I'm a student at the University of West of Scotland. Um, so my email address is there, lucy.bt at uws.ac.uk. Right, okay. Oh, I see. Okay, grand. Um, so I'm a PhD student at um, the School of Education and Social Sciences at UWS, although I work remotely out of the Highlands. And in my previous background, I've kind of done academia a wee bit back to front. Um, I did go to, I was an undergraduate as, a, as an agricultural scientist. And when I was 21, I became a farmer through circumstances beyond my control and that my parents died and I, I had to come home and run a farm in the Northwest Highlands of Scotland. And then circumstances changed me again because I had a, a big hole in my stomach so I couldn't work carrying large sheep anymore so I had to use my brain instead of my body and I realised I could and I got a few opportunities to do some teaching in agriculture and, and then I was working um, for a community education project for the Crofting Federation as well as a little bit of work for UHI and concurrent to that I started doing a master in education and Keith who sat there was my supervisor when I put my thesis in and I did that part time and I very much enjoyed that bug so um, yeah, in 2020, I decided to apply for a PhD, and that's how I ended up where I am today. Um, so I'm going to present a poster on some of the discussions uh, that have arisen out of my PhD. 
I'm in my final stages writing up and I've looked at how um, academics in Scotland link their teaching, research and public engagement. And the sort of links between teaching and research have been long established since the days of Alexander von, um, sorry, Wilhelm von Humboldt, wrong brother. Uh, and he made the sort of distinction in 1810 when he founded the University of Berlin that teaching and research should always be in unity and, and so on. Um, when I was starting to look at how um, STEM lecturers found this in Scotland, I found that there was another nexus that was described in some academic literature that I encountered um, through a paper uh, published by Elizabeth Stevenson and Jan MacArthur in 2015. There's a wee reference down there and I'm happy to share this slide with you later if you want to check that out. But they looked at what they call the triple nexus, so how research, teaching and public engagement links. And so I interviewed nine scientists working in Scottish universities who actively teach their undergraduate cohorts and ask them for some of their opinions and perceptions on how this might work in different situations. So I did a couple of phases of interviews and um, the diagram that I've got up here sort of shows you roughly how they situated and I gathered that data through analysing interviews by hand or using in vivo and um, looking at word clouds and how people actually sort of locate themselves. So some people were very much on the outer edges. Um, for example, he got this one solitary person. He was actually an engineer who'd kind of moved away from research and kind of really got into a public engagement role in, at an ancient university in Scotland. And then some folks here who definitely saw the links between teaching and research, but they, as soon as you mentioned the word public engagement, they just wanted to run away. and. They said things like, oh, I'm too old, I can't get involved with that, I can't be bothered, I don't go to science festivals. Other folks who were kind of curious, um, maybe stepping towards it a wee bit, but some had stepped back because they felt that they'd had too many demands made upon them by the university as sort of obligation to engage with the public. And they felt it was a tick box exercise and they felt quite sullied by that because often what happens is that the magic word public engagement suddenly releases a load of funding and their thoughts were well why not we are engaging with the public we're with students every day i'm talking to people in the pub i meet at night you know like what i do and that is public engagement so there's quite sort of nuanced conceptions about what public engagement is and how that's viewed within a higher education institution um i'll come back to the two folks who are in the middle um and there are some people another person lurking up there who kind of very much dealt with computer science and user experience. So they were about engaging with the public and in Scotland has certainly been a drive within the health industry uh, to look at user experience and how that drives research. Um, so I'm just sharing a few, few findings here um, on this post-it note. It's written quite small, but you're welcome to come up and have a look at the poster. Um, I found that computer scientists are using open source code, coding in Python and R with their own students and they're using students um, knowledge as well as co-creators to kind of interact with that and we had the talk earlier on from Jeffrey in the auditorium and he was um, going on about how great Python is and what an open community it is and it's a great community of practice. Um, and I said to the computer scientists, have you ever actually written that as being part of your impact case study, because I'd looked at research that had looked at the research excellence framework in the UK from 2014, and a paper that was delivered from the National Centre for Public Engagement in Bristol in 2017 showed that actually computer scientists, chemistry lecturers, phys um, physicists and so on, all those within what they define as STEM panel B disciplines are the least likely to submit impact case studies. So I wanted to find out why that was. And when I spoke to this computer scientist, I said, OK, so all the work you have been doing has got public impact. Do you submit that on your case study? And he said, no, because I actually don't know how that works. And I don't know how you'd actually quantify that. So that was a question I had for you guys today. You know, what's your experience of that? Could, could that become a legitimate um, submission? Um, chemistry lecturers as well, I spoke to them, they used OERs to mimic lab conditions and run tests in COVID-19. Um, this is particularly an example of liquid uh, gas chromatography, which was used at two different institutions. 
And one of the lecturers I spoke to had said, well, we found a few problems with it. We did a few edits amongst the class and then we put that back out into the open source community. So again, it's maybe not as uh, bright lights as going to a science festival, you're still engaging with the public. Um, and what I did find was that when I was speaking to these folks during the period of the lockdowns, I spoke to people over, well, first of all, I think we were very locked down when I first spoke to them, the second time we'd open up more, but people who are in distributed campuses, you know, much like UHI or somewhere, they've been working with open educational resources and, and have open educational practices embedded into already you know and from the get-go the day that the lockdown was kind of announced it wasn't really a massive problem and that kind of concept of pivot ped pedagogy um wasn't a new idea for them because they could easily pivot from one situation to the other um other people that i spoke to in different campuses found it quite difficult and then there were some people i interviewed and said well thank goodness we're going back to normal now and um, we can revert back to our normal ways of practice so I thought, well, open educational practices are really great for helping to increase resilience amongst your learners, your learning community, um, and also accessibility. And I think about from my own situation, obviously living somewhere very remote and rural like the Highlands. And, you know, at one point when I was going through my Master of Education, I was a mother of three still in school, um, living on a farm. So I wasn't going to get very many places very quickly. So things like open education really helped. and. I've certainly seen that through the agricultural community. So there's, I found a few differences between people's attitudes to it between post-92 um, institutions and pre-92 institutions, the kind of more ancient universities and so on. They tended to have open educational resources that were administered by what they call public engagement professionals, PEPs as a sort of acronym for that role. Um, so and I spoke about the two folks that are in the middle. Well, they um, were actually early career researchers and both based at what I would describe as an ancient university in Scotland. So somewhere like St Andrews or Edinburgh or Glasgow. And they were very much located within the middle of this nexus. And that was their kind of conceptualization or their culture change that they experienced through uh, postgraduate education and, and actually getting some teaching and learning experience and working on the PG CAP programs and they could fully recognize that this sort of triple aspect of work was really really important to what they did and so that sort of embedded the value of public engagement and they could see a role for open education within that and um, so I guess one of my questions to you guys is well if you know the research excellence framework in the UK how can we as educators actually sort of promote open educational practices but not to kind of um, incentivize it like a league table, but just to say, well, if, if, you're, if you're embedding open educational practice into what you do every day, that is public impact. And it's not necessarily having to go out and make a big show and you know, perhaps do um, a, a talk or something where lecturers sometimes feel obliged and they get sort of a bit of ennui, as I'd say, like sort of a bit of boredom, like, oh gosh, you know, we've got to go and do another bit of engagement. If it's something that you do naturally every day in your work, then it does become impact. Um, so I've put two comments up here as well from lecturers that had um, about open access journals. So um, Theta A was the first person I interviewed and they said, um, certainly from the research side of things, it's open access journals are being pushed a lot and we're submitting to them and therefore the universities need to embrace it. So that kind of suggested to me that their academic institution hadn't really sort of embraced that idea of open access journals. And I guess, again, that gets down to money and payments and funding. And if you have to go back and say, well, we need £600 to make this open access. Um, and then there's maybe a struggle to actually get that funding to do that. Why is that? You know, people should be committing to that. Um, one, another thing is about the conceptualisation of open access journals. This um, Delta I was a chemistry academic I spoke to, and they said having open access journals is great, but you write an open access article for an academic. You don't write that for a policymaker or for a member of the public, and that's where your impact comes from. So I thought that was quite interesting because in that sentence, they were kind of describing a state of othering, um, sort of suggesting you know, that a member of the public might not go and look at an open access journal. And I have to say that my experience and some of the in, um, people who I interviewed, their experience was that 
people who are not maybe connected to academia or even policy making might be searching through the net and come across an open access journal and they'll be able to read some academic literature and you know that might have impact further on their life it might make them decide to go and do you know change a career from being a farmer to a phd student you never know so i think we kind of need to look at how people conceptualize that and of course there are different levels of impact that can be derived from your knowledge creation um so <laughs> i guess i've asked if i could get a bit of help and feedback from you guys and my purpose for being here today is to sort of share my posts which you're welcome to come and have a more detailed look at get some feedback get some ideas i'm writing a discussion chapter just now so if anyone wants to collaborate with me as well that's very i'm very open to that because i'm a remote student so you have to make as many connections as you can um and i just want to ask questions again you know how would we as educators define open educational practices within the definition of public impact and i don't know if you ever saw the quiz show um, where they used to have the line points mean prizes so unfortunately it seems to be the way that you know funding works points mean prizes so how do we translate that into a practical um solution um some of the things i've looked at obviously creative common license um things like that you know that figure i put on figshare which is an open access place to share your figures but you know just kind of knowing that and making that an everyday practice in your life can then make your work more open um so yeah, I guess I'm just going to finish up now um, and yeah, offer it out to any of you guys for any feedback or questions you might have. Um, um, a couple of suggestions. I mean, one is, I mean, you mentioned it yourself at the end there about um, critical Commons licences and certainly one of the things that we kind of uh, work very hard with at the University of Edinburgh is encouraging the use of Creative Commons licences because if you want to ensure that a resource is genuinely open, it has to have that open licence, otherwise it's just a thing on the net and people mm -hmm. won't know how they can use it. Once you go down the open access research publishing route, then the research paper should be open licensed. But I think, you know, we all um, engage in a lot of practice, but to really make that open, it does need to be shared under open licence. And also in terms of, um, I was really interested in what you were saying about the accessibility of open access journals and you know, how, how accessible are they to the public and I think, you know, it's great that they're there but one of the things that we also encourage is using other routes to communicate um, the outputs of academic research, for example academic blogging, mm -hmm. uh, because that can work um, in harmony with sort of publishing open access journal papers, but it can bring that research to a whole new audience. So we actually have an academic blogging service in the university and I run a course um, for staff and postgraduate research uh, students on how they can use professional blogging to promote their professional practice and their research careers. And I've got open resources I can share with you about that. Okay, thank you. Elizabeth? Yeah, to what extent, and it's a, it's a question as much as anything else, but following on from Creative Commons, to what extent do you think that copyright as applied to non open access materials impinges on public engagement with some open educational materials? You know, there's a lot of open access journals, Creative Commons materials, and but copyright is applied to a variety of materials pre Creative Commons coming along. So, does that impinge, do you think, on the open education experience and how it works with public engagement? It probably can. I mean, if you think about even pictures, on, you know, if you're making Microsoft Word documents, say my kids are at school making one yeah. and I, I, they look to and say, I say, well, actually check that it's got Creative Commons licensing, you tick the box, mm -hmm. and then that suddenly restricts everything that they can actually, yeah. you know, put up on there. So um, for, for other situations, I suppose, it's about awareness of where copyright comes and then perhaps it's only if someone makes a mistake or an error or doesn't realise about copyright that it comes back to them. Um, I guess when you're involved in the academic world you have knowledge about copyright and how it impinges but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes Keith. Uh, that was great thank you. This, this kind of relates to Lorna's points as well but I think um, what your, your research has shown is a real tension between publishing openly mm -hmm. and writing openly mm -hmm. um, and I think um, if, if we're kind of looking at knowledge that should be public knowledge then I think within institutions we need to think really carefully about how that's communicated and then blogging is one way obviously um, mm -hmm. but we've got a, a kind of 
bigger problem, I think. You mentioned the ref, and mm -hmm. as, a, as a national exercise, the ref values um, uh, and rates work on its sort of scientific rigor, whether that's in the sciences or the social sciences, doesn't necessarily, doesn't rate work at all on the extent to which um, the work produced can be public knowledge, and it's written as public knowledge. So I think there's something that, that really has to be addressed there as well, yeah. um, if we're going to move forward in, in this particular area. Yeah, okay, that's good to know. Um, yes. Yeah, just to add on Lorna's point that um, I think e-portfolios yeah, also support mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. academic blogging and it's a bit more on the institutionally uh, encouraged side for us at least mm -hmm. from DCU, so the Dublin City University, yeah, okay. and reflective or not, to just mm -hmm. e-portfolios in general would be one yeah. of the ways I would add. Yeah, that, that okay. can work. It's done well. Yeah, that's good to know. Yes. I'm also thinking kind of anecdotally of the recent ref results. In the School of Informatics, we've had this presentation day um, of these all these five-star and four-star impact uh, ref impact case studies. And from my point of view, I noticed the pattern between the most successful stories where it's like we came up with this new kind of technology it was incorporated in the products of this really large company which has this many uh, consumers and therefore we have impact on this many people in the world so like this kind of indirect impact which is very easily quantifiable uh, by the user base of an organization here if you share open code on a forum, you can't really say that all the users of that forum are now users of what you shared. Whereas with a company that makes products, kind of it's more acceptable to say that all the users of this company are now influenced by the technology the company adopts. So maybe going via open companies is a solution. Open companies? What do you mean by open companies? Companies that adopt open practices. Oh, that's a good idea. That's a good idea, yeah. So kind of mutual understanding between the end user and, and the person that puts it out. Yes. Another really good way to um, share uh, outputs for public engagement is to integrate them with the Wikimedia projects. Oh, I was listening, I was actually listening to your podcast yeah. on that. Yeah. So, so. The, I mean, it's, it's tricky when it comes to original research because you can't post your own original research on Wikipedia. And in mm -hmm. fact, you, you shouldn't even really post primary sources on Wikipedia. Wikipedia is fueled by secondary sources mm -hmm. that will actually um, critique and comment the, the original research. But we've had a lot of success with students writing Wikipedia entries about scientific topics, which and their entries um, will synthesize the available research and, and to create new Wikipedia entries. And we've had, we've had some really great examples of that, particularly um, our sort of biological sciences. Um, we had one student created an article on a form of um, a very common form of ovarian cancer that had no Wikipedia article and she wrote the article for it and it's now in some like 150,000 views wow. and that was an undergraduate assignment and most undergraduate assignments just here the black hole. Yeah. That's still there on Wikipedia so there are definitely ways that you can use Wikipedia, Wikidata, Wiki Commons for public engagement, you just have to be careful that you don't contravene the um, the sort of neutral point of view and the conflict of interest and all these kind of uh, yeah. checks and balances they have in place. But we can do UK can help you with that. Oh, really? So yeah, if you contact them, um, there is a projects coordinator for Scotland called Sarah Thomas who works in for Wikimedia UK and she can provide advice and this kind of stuff. Oh, that'd be good. Thank you. Okay, any other questions or comments? So just sorry, one comment about your um, what your research participants said about uh, you writing for an audience of academics. And I can understand that, especially in STEM, if they're writing quite technical stuff with um, jargon and stuff, they don't expect a lay audience to read it. But aren't they part of disciplinary networks that include people in countries? Who don't have access to these table journals. Mm. I think living in these well-resourced environments, we sometimes tend to forget there are thousands of people following the science, who, mm. but they can't access all this stuff. 
um, and maybe it's a case of you know building more explicit partnerships across different yeah. communities so that people can actually see who's reading my stuff and what they're getting on. I think that's been evident actually in agriculture because OERs and yeah. agriculture yeah. really first yeah. came out of Africa and developing yeah. nations, yeah. and then you know that kind of concept moved more into. European OER culture. So yeah, maybe there's something to learn there from yeah. that aspect of science. Okay, great. Then I think a round of applause.